Internet presents Dialogue, an international televised exchange of ideas. Now, from our studios in Washington, D.C., here is your moderator, broadcast journalist, Jack Reynolds. Good afternoon and welcome to WorldNet's Dialogue. Today, for audiences in Europe and participants in Geneva and Stuttgart, we present a special program on the computational science revolution. I'd like to extend a special welcome to participants at Geneva's Telcom 87, the world's largest and most important telecommunications exposition. Joining us in our Washington studio today are John Stevenson, Corporate Relations Officer with the University of Illinois Foundation, and Larry Smarr, Professor of Physics and Astronomy and Director of the National Center for Supercomputer Applications at the University of Illinois. Gentlemen, welcome to WorldNet's Dialogue. Thank you. Glad to be here. It's no exaggeration to say that Dr. Larry Smarr is a pioneer in the movement to obtain federal support for U.S. universities. His 1982 paper on the supercomputer famine at American universities is regarded as a landmark in that movement. It was written after it became necessary for him to travel to West Germany to gain access to an American-made supercomputer to complete his research. It resulted in a successful proposal to the National Science Foundation to establish the National Center for Supercomputing Applications at the University of Illinois. This proposal was the catalyst which focused national policy on the importance of establishing supercomputer centers. Dr. Smarr stands in a long tradition of brilliant scientists who realized the potential of a new technology to vastly expand man's knowledge. He spent an enormous amount of time helping educate this country's public, Congress, industry leaders, scientists, and university administrators about the need for the National Supercomputer Program. We're delighted to have him as our guest today. Mr. Stevenson's role has been to encourage corporate involvement in the National Center for Supercomputer Applications. Mr. Stevenson, Illinois appears to have achieved a successful union of scientific and commercial objectives. Jack, very much so. Um, a model partnership has really been created between a world-class university, a state which has built the proper environment for technology, and the federal government. In that partnership, we're bringing in uh, leaders from American industry to participate. It's already proven to be a framework that's been very successful. Dr. Smarr, could you tell us a little bit about the growth of supercomputer power in the United States? Yes. Uh, one thing I think is very important is illustrated in the first slide. When we talk about the supercomputer, we're talking about uh, a, the world's fastest computer at any given time. In the slide, the supercomputer is the red box in the background. But you see here a typical scientist using that supercomputer by working on a personal computer at his desk. Now, in this case, the personal computer is sitting in the machine room with the supercomputer, but what we're seeing is all over the United States, individual scientists working with their personal computers hooked over networks to distant supercomputers. In this case, the personal computer is an Apple Macintosh. The supercomputer from, built by Cray Research behind it is a thousand times more powerful than that personal computer. The next slide shows that even though we have enormously powerful machines now in 87 at the first red bar, the growth in the speed of the supercomputers over the next five years will provide us with machines that are uh, up to 20 times faster than today's machines. When you see the results of the uh, calculations that can be done with today's supercomputer, just imagine what we'll be able to do during the next five years. This growth in power has become possible because of what we call parallel computers, many computers inside the same box. The next slide is something I'm very proud of. This is a map of the United States only a year and a half after the supercomputing program was initiated by Congress and the National Science Foundation. Each of those circles is an American university in which scientists and researchers now have access to this kind of supercomputing power. Our center at the University of Illinois is one of five national centers sponsored by the National Science Foundation. Each of the other centers could show you a similar map. The size of those circles gives you an idea of the amount of supercomputing power that's being delivered to each of those universities, some in excess of over 1,000 hours per year. The next slide 
shows the beginning of what is going to be a very important component of the United States national infrastructure. This is the National Science Foundation's NSF net, a network electronically hooking together the most important research universities in the country with the five supercomputer centers you can see in the solid black line connecting from California to the East Coast. An important part of this, I believe, is that Illinois has traditionally been the uh, railhead, whether it in this country for the infrastructure, whether we go back to the railroads or today in the airline industry or telecommunication industry, I think you'll see with all the fiber optic being laid in the United States that once again Chicago and the state of Illinois will be central to this involving national network. The national architecture that's being put into place is one of literally thousands of personal computers, each themselves very powerful, capable of doing the sorts of visualization we'll see in the next few minutes at the desktop of each person. They can be customized to that person's everyday working needs. They can have their word processing, uh, spreadsheets, and with a flick of the button, a supercomputer, a thousand times more powerful, hooking in to that personal computer as a coprocessor. That national architecture has not existed in this country before. It's something that I think is a very powerful, positive message for the future. Thank you, Dr. Smart. And now we'll turn to our overseas guests for an initial round of questions. I'd like to remind our participants to please identify themselves and their organizations. Let's begin with Geneva. Go ahead, Geneva. Dr. Molina from in Geneva. My question is to Professor Smar. Professor Smar, you started your presentation showing a supercomputer together with microcomputer. Today, personal computers have the power mainframes had some 20 years ago. I would like to know what time span you foresee to have personal computers with the power of today's mainframes or even supercomputers. Yes. The, the question is, uh, as time goes on, uh, for many decades now, uh, computers have gotten more and more powerful. Uh, today's personal computers are as powerful as the supercomputer of 20 years ago. And the question is, when do I see the personal computers of the future becoming as powerful as today's supercomputer? Uh, and I would say we would see that um, roughly in the next 10 years. Um, the interesting point, though, is that by the time that my uh, computer on my desktop becomes as powerful as a Cray supercomputer of 1987, the supercomputer of that era will still be a thousand times more powerful than that personal computer. That is, this hierarchy of computers will stay in place. And in fact, there are a number of levels uh, it's very important to realize it's not just the personal computer hooked to the supercomputer. There are intermediate levels of machines. For instance, the new mini supercomputers, such as Alliant Computer uh, uh, Corporation has generated, in which the machine might be, say, about one-tenth as powerful as a supercomputer. Then there are machines maybe one-tenth as powerful as that, uh, which, by the way, are coming out as new workstations, scientific workstations, such as the Sun 4. Uh, then a factor of 10 below that maybe is the personal computer. I believe that hierarchical uh, nature of the computers is very important because a scientist today is going to use many computers out through the country hooked together by this network at one time on one problem. That's the new world of distributed computing as opposed to the old days in which we have a dumb terminal hooked to a mainframe. Thank you, Geneva. Now we'll go to Stuttgart. Please go ahead, Stuttgart. Karl Reinsch, University of Stuttgart Computer Center. Hello, Professor Smar. What are you doing in Washington? We expect you in Stuttgart. I will be Karl there. I think will be here too. Yes, I, I would very much My like to be there. Is, uh, and the Cray 2 is available. My question is what, uh, what are your plans in migration of your computer centers and National Science Foundation computer centers? 
the plans for the future. The, uh, right now, the National Science Foundation uh, is wrestling with the problem of how to uh, guarantee that the National Supercomputer Centers stay at the state of the art for the foreseeable future. That is requiring a very novel relationship to be developed between the national centers, the computer manufacturers, and the federal government. Uh, that new alliance is something we haven't seen before. And uh, it's something I'm very active in myself. I think that that will happen. And I think uh, the Congress will vote the necessary funds to make sure that this country's facilities stay at the state of the art. Uh, in addition, as you know, uh, there is uh, a great deal of effort in all of the centers to involve American industry directly in the participation uh, of research in the national centers. Thank you, Stuttgart. Dr. Smar, can you give us an example of visualization using the supercomputer? Yes. Uh, I've chosen to take an example from engineering to try to demonstrate the difference between the way in which the human being sees the output of a calculation with more or less today's technologies versus tomorrow's. Here is an example of a block of aluminum in which there is a hairline crack in the center, the horizontal dark line. One then, to calculate uh, the fracture of this block, one lays a grid, as you can see, uh, of moving finite elements uh, down mathematically, and at each point of each square, uh, one then calculates in the computer the uh, shear, the strain, uh, the velocity of the material as it is stressed. So the important thing to realize is that we go from the continuous medium of the real world to this net or grid of a finite number of squares that define the problem in the supercomputer. Now, when you put this on the machine, you may have several hundred thousand of these little squares at each moment in time in which you're evaluating how, as you squeeze the material, the pressure and density change, the velocity changes throughout that block of, of aluminum. The next slide shows an example of the typical output of such a run. You have time going horizontally, and vertically you have a particular uh, quantity such as the stress. And in this case, you can only evaluate it at, say, one point, at, say, the end of the crack tip. Now, I hope that this picture looks as obscure to you as it does to me. I get very little information out of looking at such a picture, and yet this is the standard way after we've done a supercomputer evaluation, a run of this entire process of squeezing the aluminum and letting it fracture, this is all the information we're getting out. Contrast that to the next picture, which is taken, <coughs> which is using now the modern techniques of visualization on graphics workstations, the personal computers we were talking about on people's desks, this is that block of aluminum in which we've looked at two physical variables. The vertical one, the vertical height is giving uh, a particular quantity, the kinetic energy, and the color on that surface is giving another variable. You can see here that the crisscrosses from reflected uh, uh, wave patterns in the material, you can see the uh, spherical outgoing waves that are coming from the ends of the crack tip. All of that information was calculated in the computer, but we didn't have a way to see all of those hundreds of thousands of numbers. What we've done is converted those numbers into an image. We used color to represent variation rather than numbers. So in this case, uh, red is very intense and blue is very low value. We can go further. We can now make a videotape of that entire process. If we ha In the videotape, what you'll see now is the beginning in which the block of aluminum is unstressed. There the stress waves are coming in. They hit the crack. We now blow up the picture. You see the crack tips develop great spikes of uh, strain, and they become like two rocks dropped in a pond sending out these spherical waves which overlap with one another and cause uh, the, in the interference in the central region. Uh, the supercomputer has calculated all those numbers, but without the ability to visualize, to turn those millions of numbers into a moving image, 
we were not able to get that information into our minds as scientists, and we were certainly not able to share it with our colleagues as we are doing it today. You do not have to be a specialist, as Robert Haber is, who's the civil engineer who did this problem. You do not have to be a specialist in crack propagation to see how the waves interact with each other. All you have to have ever done is look at a pond and drop a rock in it. So it, it widens the audience enormously of people who can participate in this scientific revolution. And I think just if we go back one more time to, the, to just verify the point. For the same supercomputer run, you either have this output or, the next slide, this output. The same amount of supercomputing time was used for both. The difference is whether you use the machine on your desktop to visualize the output or not. Thank you, Dr. Smart. Now let's return to Geneva. Geneva, go ahead, please. My name is uh, Pascal Ditten from the World Health Organization. I would like to ask a non-technical question, which both speakers may attempt to answer. Professor Smart just stated that there is a computer revolution going on, which has been going on for a number of years. And as you know, any revolution has an outcome which is not totally predictable. And probably the same could be said about the computer revolution. Now, we know that computers, and in particular through microcomputers, are having a great impact on society. As scientists, researchers, people who are involved in the decision-making process in computing, could you ma make few comments about your feelings, your sense of concern about what will be, what the impacts on society might occur from making available to each individual in 10 years' time computing power, which is equivalent to today's supercomputers. Yes, I'd be happy to. I, th I think the personal computer is one of the most beneficial revolutions we've had in technology. Um, you have to remember that that it's a very young revolution. Only five years ago, IBM brought out its personal computer, which really swept the, the corporate world uh, and led uh, Apple Computer, of course, before that, had, had, had brought out the machine that is very widely used in schools today. Um, before that time, many people were very skeptical of computers. They were very afraid of computers because they had never themselves personally used a computer. Uh, they were being manipulated, as it were, by computers. We had all these stories about the banks writing checks for a million dollars uh, because of an error and, and so forth. People felt, um, in a way, sort of like a puppet. Uh, the mainframe computer had all the power. The high priest around the, the, the mainframe protected it from the, the masses. Uh, the personal computer was a revolutionary social uh, invention. It, it, it smashed the, the priesthood. It, it distributed computing power t uh, to everyone. Just to give you an example, uh, even though five years ago, the, the, as I say, the main commercial uh, introduction of the personal computer occurred, there are over 25 million personal computers on people's desk in this country. There are only 150 supercomputers. So the revolution is over. Most of the computing power in the country it now resides on people's desktops where they control it. They customize it to their everyday use. What we will see in the future is that instead of the typical typewriter input and output which we have today, most of that extra power in the, in the personal computer will go to make the interface more natural for human beings. You will see much more visual, much more uh, speech input and output. Uh, the personal computer, I believe, will become every person's friend. Uh, it will be like your pet dog. Uh, or you will actually, it will get to know you. It will know nuances about how you like to see things presented. Uh, you will have a sort of shorthand way of asking it questions. Uh, the only reason it would be able to do that is because of the enormous computing power that it will have in the background, behind the, 
the uh, screen, as it were. I think a lot of this you see already with the, for instance, in the Apple or Sun computers with the icons and the ability to, of using the mouse to, to simply push and point and, and have the machine do things. That's just a beginning of what we'll see. So the computing power will mainly be used to make the human feel more natural in interacting with the computer. And I think that will be extremely beneficial. I think um, it, it will make people really accept the computer in a, in a very good way. Mr. Stevenson, can we get a reaction to that question from you? Well, Jack, what I see in, in uh, <clears throat> corporations that we're talking to is a tremendous uh, interest developing uh, from the researchers, and the researchers that have come to uh, our center have become more and more accustomed to, to using the tools. And as that evolves, obviously the, the end product uh, downstream is going to be a product coming to the marketplace faster, a product with much better quality because of the depth of the, uh, the ability to do the research. And so it's, uh, it's amazing to me to see the advancements taking place with the companies that we're, we're talking to. It clearly is, is going to change uh, the products on, uh, on the face of this earth. Geneva, thank you. Now we go back to Stuttgart. Go ahead, please, Stuttgart. I'm Walter Burkhardt, University of Stuttgart Department of Computer Science. As a long-time advocate of dynamic simulation, I see one problem, and this is that on one side we have the university researchers without much money, but the problems for solving on supercomputers, and on the other hand we have the industrial users with the problems and with the money, but no knowledge of the solution and the computer. Yes, uh, I think you're absolutely right. We see that in this country as well. And that is why, as director of, of uh, the National Center for Supercomputing Applications, from the beginning, uh, I have been dedicated to bringing together the industrial research community with the university research community. Uh, the problems that they have in learning how to use uh, these distributed environments, all of this new software tools, are the same. And yet, in our country, certainly, industry and university has have grown apart for for many decades and I think that that's hurt our country I, I think that it uh, is showing up in things like the international uh, trade our uh, difficulty in, in, in being able to compete uh, in certain areas so we have initiated a full industrial partners program at our center uh, there will be ten of the leading corporations spanning the economy uh, each partner uh, puts up a million dollars a year for three years to immerse their corporation in the environment that we've created at our center. Uh, in addition to simply having a supercomputer, we have created what we would believe is the electronic laboratory of tomorrow. Uh, we have some 200 personal computers and workstations, all networked together with high-speed links. We have many computer scientists working with us. We have professors from all the different departments, including not only engineering and science, but art, music, social sciences. We have many national visitors coming through. It's a national melting pot. And into that, for instance, the Kodak, uh, Eastman Kodak Corporation has been a partner for one year. During that year, they've sent over 40 of their researchers to live in our center for times varying from a few days to, to weeks. And uh, in the next uh, video, I will show you an example of how that, that interdisciplinary melting between the uh, universities and, and industry have, have, have led to new ideas. This glyph we're showing you is a new kind of graphic way to present a manufacturing process. Here you have a mold that we will inject plastic into. It's a two-step, a higher and a lower mold. And what you see now is the supercomputer simulation of that viscous fluid as the plastic begins to go e into the part that's easiest, the high part, you see fairly uniformly. And then as it tries to go into the small part, you see there is sort of a jet developing of material in which the, the length of the triangles is proportional to the velocity. That means as we come in, we'll choreograph this so that we can come in and, and follow it more closely now that we've seen it. You see again, the, the vertical uh, color is the temperature, the color on the plane is the pressure, and there you see the jetting of the material 
uh, non-uniformly into the lower half. That means that that lower part, the thin part, where the, the material went very fast through the center part, that may uh, uh, freeze, as it were, into the end plastic at a different rate than on either side, leading to a brittle piece of, of plastic. Um, therefore, you can now go back and say, if we injected the plastic, say, in a different direction, if we were able to go in and, say, change the temperature that we were sending it in, we can then re-simulate that with the supercomputer, re-visualize it until we get a good uniform fill of that mold. Now, that is an example of a professor of computer art in the art department working together with one of our computer professionals and with Rich Elson, who is one of the scientists at Eastman Kodak, this is a brand new way of visualizing a three-dimensional time-dependent flow. And it's, it's a way that I think is very important. It, it, it takes the people who make these in the manufacturing division and gives them, as it were, x-ray eyes to see into the process that is otherwise a black box. That kind of interaction we've found to be extremely beneficial uh, and one that only occurs in this new kind of national center. Stuttgart, we are still with you. Do you have another question, please? My name is Bernard Gom. I'm an R&D manager for Hewlett Packard Germany. Uh, you earlier mentioned, uh, Professor Smart, uh, voice processing. Voice processing being a sub-element of AI. Uh, could you try to give, give us a view how AI is going to be developing over the next decade when computer power is getting more competitive and more cheaper for the users? Yes. Well, of course, Hewlett Packard is one of the great names uh, in the computer industry, and, and they have uh, done a lot of the research uh, that has led to some of the very nice uh, uh, devices of the sort you talk about today. Uh, I should emphasize that my field is not computer science. Uh, I'm actually an astrophysicist and, uh, and a person who works with uh, general relativity and that sort of thing. I'm fascinated, just as many people are, by the developments in artificial intelligence. I think that they're absolutely critical uh, in the coming years for one important reason as a user. The computer architecture, the system of all of these different computers all hooked together with different properties and multiple windows and, and so forth, is just becoming far too complicated for an individual scientist to have to master. So one of the first things I think you'll see is a masking of those computers by an artificial intelligence um, interface on your personal computer. Uh, you know, when you pick up the telephone, you pick it up to call someone and make a business deal or to order uh, a product or something. You don't sit there trying to figure out what the operating system of this receiver on your desk is or how to make the signals go through the network or how the electronic switch down at the headquarters works. Maybe the phone company was like that in the past. Fortunately, it isn't that way today or no one would use telephones. So I think that one of the first things you're going to see is computer scientists working to find ways to make the computer power in your desk run all those other computers and to send your signals out and get them back and interpret them in a way that you want. Um, that, that is the user interface question. Uh, I think in addition, you're going to see, particularly in the, in, in the industrial applications, the uh, artificial intelligence techniques being used to allow uh, a user to probe lots of different examples of how, say, the particular manufacturing process uh, being simulated um, is looked at. You know, you, you, right now it's just these, these codes are becoming very, very complicated to write, many, many thousands of lines of code, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of lines. And again, computer science techniques and artificial intelligence uh, in programming languages and so forth will be very critical to the users. In addition, of course, there are just going to be very interesting abstract developments in computer science. I've been talking more about the applications of the computer science and artificial intelligence. Let's, uh, at this point, go back to Geneva for another question. Go ahead, please, Geneva. To Molina Computer Geneva. This question is for uh, Professor Smar or Mr. Stevenson. I would like to know what you see of the next breakthrough in supercomputer technology. Additionally, I would like to know your view 
about the architecture of the supercomputer of the future. That's to say, uh, precisely, it will involve uh, faster single processors or more sophisticated parallel processing systems. Dr. Smart, would you take that one? Right. Um, I think that the one thing for sure we can say is that the supercomputers of the present and of the future will be parallel architecture machines. Uh, all of the major supercomputers today, whether it's from uh, IBM or, or Cray or Control Data, most of the Japanese supercomputers are parallel. That is, they have a number of very fast processors uh, that are working um, to solve a problem. They may be used independently from each other on, say, if there's four processors on four different problems at the same time to increase the throughput, or all four may gang tackle one problem. Now, right now, the architecture that we see is a few number, 4, 8, 16, of the very fastest possible processors. You are beginning to see architectures which are at the other extreme, namely 100,000 processors that are very slow but very cheap to make. Uh, I think it is very unclear at this point which of these will turn out to be the market leader. I think what you're going to go from is a dominant supercomputer that you can identify, for instance, with the Cray XMP today as uh, two-thirds of the market share worldwide. You'll go from that to a much more diverse set of architectures, uh, all the way from a few processors to hundreds of thousands. And then what you'll find is that the problems you're trying to solve will work better on one or another of those architectures. That is, there won't be a unique solution, what is the best supercomputer for all problems. There will be, what is the best architecture for the particular problem I'm working on today. And I think what we are looking forward to in the National Centers is a place to experiment uh, with a garden of architectures to decide, as, as the scientists in, in the country work with one another, which will be uh, the best for their particular application. Geneva, do you have another question? Uh, Pascal Ditelme from uh, WHO again. Professor Smart, as you know, the 1987 Nobel Prize for Physics was just granted to researchers from the IBM Research Center in Zurich for the discovery of new superconducting material. This area of research is presently very active. What is, in your mind, the likely consequences of this discovery on computer technology, and in particular, on for supercomputers? Thank you. Yes. Uh, well, it certainly was one of the most exciting discoveries uh, in my lifetime as a scientist, the high temperature superconducting uh, from the IBM scientist in, in Zurich. Um, and as you know, it's led to a, a, to a situation I guess I've never seen in my lifetime in terms of scientists all over the world uh, rushing to this uh, field of research uh, to try to uh, hopefully push the superconductivity up to actual room temperatures. Um, we don't know yet whether that can be done. I've talked with people at most of the major supercomputing companies about the impact of superconductivity on their machines. Um, I think there is perhaps less of a impact than you might expect from the public media uh, in the short term. The reason is that uh, even if you could make the circuits um, in the chips uh, infinitely fast, uh, the point is that they are still part of a package, and that package uh, is hooked together with other chips to make these boxes you saw as large as the supercomputer you saw in the first picture. Um, the packages are where the delays still are. So the computer is only as fast as its slowest part. And unfortunately, those slow parts are not so obvious how we're going to speed those up, even if we do have these uh, supercomputers. Conductors. The other problem, of course, as you know, is the superconducting materials are ceramics and therefore are very difficult to make into wires, although some uh, nice work with film uh, uh, 
laying down film on, on the uh, chips has been done by um, some of the major uh, players. So I, I think you will not see an impact before about 10 years out uh, on uh, a, much of a speed up because of the high temperature superconductivity. Geneva, thank you very much. Stuttgart, we're coming back to you. Do you have a question, please? Yes, this is Hart Blair. I'm a development manager with IBM laboratory in Böblingen, close to Stuttgart. Professor Smar, I would like to come back to your basic structure, the supercomputer and the personal computer. How do you see the role of the general purpose mainframe in between those basic structures to support databases as well as programming for the supercomputer? Well, I think it's extremely important, and it goes back to the notion of this middle tier of computer. At our center, uh, we're totally dependent on the IBM general purpose mainframe uh, for our file system, and we will be uh, upgrading, in fact, to the 3090 uh, vector facility uh, uh, next year, uh, and are doing a lot of uh, very interesting joint work with IBM uh, in the area of exploring um, how it will interface, as it were, between the personal computer and the supercomputer. Um, I think that the enormous quantities um, of data that are generated by the supercomputer, by next year the machine can make up to a 1 billion, 1,000 million uh, multiplications every second. Um, and these, of course, are running 24 hours a day, seven days a week that in prodigious amount of data that's, that is produced uh, must be stored in some fashion. And uh, right now, the general purpose mainframe and your standard rotating disk and the IBM tape cartridges are what is more or less the universal solution. Um, I think it's an area that needs a great deal of research and push. I think the, uh, it's, it's really that has become the bottleneck. The supercomputer can produce numbers faster than we can store them. And that's one reason I'm very keen to go to the visualization. Uh, you can go from a single number, a byte, to an image, which is a million bytes. And yet the human can look at an image as fast as it can look at a number. And that's a million times more information. So that alone is, is one of the major reasons for going to visualization. Also, of course, we use the supercomputer for other reasons. You can have a huge database, say, produced by a spacecraft or a telescope that you have so much data that you want to use the supercomputer to calculate on it. And in fact, I think that you'll see more and more use of supercomputers in standard data processing operations. I think you'll see it in financial companies, you'll see it in banks, uh, you'll see it uh, already in Japan. A lot of the Japanese uh, banks are using uh, supercomputers, often IBM uh, supercomputers, to uh, calculate every day the entire international uh, currency market, the, the stock exchanges that are going 24 hours a day. And, and so I think that, that the, the general purpose mainframe um, will continue for as far as I can see as a critical component in the overall system architecture that I'm talking about. Stuttgart, back to you for another question. I'm Walter Burkhardt again from the University of Stuttgart Department of Computer Science. I have two comments. The first is on parallel computation. Uh, what, what I am understanding you are advocating ad, uh, a computation on a large scale parallelism. And I think there have been some experiments in the past, for example, the ILIAC-4, which, which was a notorious example for not being able using parallelism in problem solving. And I don't think there is much possibility for the general applications areas in, in using parallel computation on a large scale. That's the first comment. The second is with these sub superconducting materials. We had uh, put some hope in the Josephson Junction effect for computational purposes, but uh, the development has been stopped by IBM, and I don't think it will come to a fruition, e even if some Japanese companies are offering on the market some Josephson. Uh, effect uh, devices. What we have now is, right now already, are gallium arsenide circuits at cryogenic temperatures which are performing just as well, at least as well as Josephson junctions or these possible 
superconducting ceramic materials. Yes, let me take the first question. I totally agree with you about the difficulty of using uh, parallel computers. However, the ILIAC-4 supercomputer that was at the University of Illinois in the late 60s used all of its parallel processors in lockstep. Today's parallel machines are much more flexible and are able to use entirely different algorithms to uh, uh, do something on one processor or something else on another processor. Whether the, the large parallel machines will in fact be generally useful, I share the same reservations you do. I don't know. But for specialized uh, problems, there is no question that they will be incredibly fast compared to a general purpose machine. Um, I have no particular comment on the, on the second statement. I think those are, those are interesting developments that you're talking about. Dr. Smore, there must be hundreds of applications for supercomputer visualization. Can you take a minute and show us a couple? Sure. What I'd like to do is to have the next slide where we talk about some of the new science that's coming um, uh, as a result of this. This is a, a, uh, an example of a supercomputer um, uh, calculation on a protein. Those are atoms in uh, the protein that uh, causes photosynthesis, the conversion of sunlight into energy. Now what the scientist, uh, the lead scientist was Klaus Schulten actually uh, from Munich, Germany, uh, he came to our center and his interest was to see those atoms vibrate in real time as they would in that molecule in, 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 uh, as the mo if, in when the protein is actually in the cell. And we have the video, the magic of the supercomputer allows us to actually see how the atoms vibrate. Uh, and, and the use of the middle tier machine, the Alliant, allows us to go in and make this visualization where the scientists can cut out uh, mathematically the outer part and go in and see, for instance, the bouncing red iron atom at the bottom of the screen and look at how the structure of this protein allows the photosynthesis to occur. Um, as you know, uh, biotechnology, the, the understanding of how to use biomolecules is just beginning, and I see the next century as dominated by uh, discoveries in that. And I think the supercomputer will be absolutely critical to the development of uh, this new biomolecular science. The next slide gets to more of the societal impacts. Uh, here is an example of a photograph. This is the real thing. This is a thunderstorm uh, as it occurs in nature. And as we know, these severe storms can cause a lot of damage. They can produce tornadoes, hail, uh, wind shear that, of course, wrecks airplanes ever so often. So one of the things that we hope through the use of supercomputers is to better understand these powerful forces of nature so that we can be better at predicting them. The next video shows an example of the supercomputer uh, simulating the growth of a severe storm and the uh, use here now of the Wavefront uh, software on the Alliant Mini Supercomputer to visualize the outer uh, envelope of rainwater in that severe storm as it develops. And you see on the left of your screen a hook developing. That is the beginning of the development of a tornadic stub storm. If we can understand how these severe storms uh, are created and are, are developing in time, perhaps we'll be able to, to uh, have better warning uh, about uh, their impact. Obviously, you've read in the news about the ozone uh, hole developing over Antarctica. The uh, supercomputer is used to simulate uh, whether the chlorine is more important than the weather forces in creating that. The same goes for the nuclear winter simulations in which we're trying to learn about the uh, climatic impact uh, following a nuclear war. The supercomputer is instrumental in these attempts to understand how um, these forces interact with uh, society. Visualization, of course, is, is very important. Uh, I think, again, a comment here that, that to have the, these visualizations just don't sort of come out of your workstation. We have assembled at our center some of the best people from the uh, computer graphics industry in Los Angeles who have come to take and use these facilities for scientific simulation rather than just special effects in movies. And that team, again, is, is very important uh, for industry as well as, as, as these other problems. Absolutely fascinating. But we've got to return now to Geneva. Geneva, do you have any comments or questions? Go ahead, please. 
Dr. Molina Computre, Geneva. Supercomputers are tools intended to solve larger problems, as the one you just mentioned, and problems also that, that are like the weather problem that you mentioned, that require faster uh, processing. Is there any problem, either too large to be handled by today, today's supercomputers, or requiring a processing speed not yet achieved, that is waiting for a more computer power to, to be solved? Well, absolutely, and I think uh, the important point to realize is that we are just beginning to solve the problems of the complexity as we see in nature. John, I think we see uh, with the people coming to visit us from industry um, just almost an insatiable need for faster machines to solve their problems, wouldn't you say? Oh, <coughs> absolutely, Larry. The, the impact on, on uh, the corporate problems has been an interesting one to, to see evolve. When we first start talking to most companies, we find out that it's really a learning process for them to evaluate the type of applications that they want to use with this type of power and the visualization tools that exist in, in Larry's Center. Uh, over a period of time and experience, as that, uh, as that grows, why the depth of those applications gets greater and greater. It's not, not uncommon for companies to come to us and, and struggle with how do we even use, uh, use a supercomputer but in a matter of, of just a few months, uh, they have many applications that are exploring various problems that they never dreamed of before. Uh, now they have the tool. Now they can go into that depth, and uh, that's been, of course, very rewarding for them, and, of course, it's uh, very important for their particular research. Stuttgart, we're going to go back to you for one question. Go ahead, please. University of Stuttgart again. Uh, we feel that the industry is very conservative uh, in using this new dimension of scientific research. Is uh, this the same in your country? I, I might comment on that. Um, I think, the, again, what we're, what we're seeing with, uh, with companies, and we've been working now a little over a year and a half, with really going out and marketing uh, this joint research, if you will, the, the use of the supercomputer and visualization, uh, that companies, uh, you might say, are conservative, but I, I view it a different way. I think that they're learning how to use uh, the tool. Computational science as, as a whole is a very new way to do research. And what we see evolve at the highest levels of every corporation we're talking about, every single one of them, is that it impacts the long-range business plan of the company it impacts the way they do research. Uh, it, in, it impacts the whole mechanical process that goes in within a, uh, on within a company on how they get a new product to the, uh, to the marketplace. So I think it, it may be conservative from one dimension, but I, I see it really as a, as a learning experience and one that as companies uh, do learn, they're just absolutely very, very interested and very excited in, in pursuing it. But it takes time to do that. It would be interesting to see one example of visualization used for other than scientific or commercial purposes. Uh, Dr. Smart, does computational science spill over into the arts? Well, it, it certainly does at our center. We've made uh, a concerted effort from the beginning to involve people from the humanities and the arts uh, in our uh, facility. As you saw earlier in the Kodak video, Donna Cox, who is uh, a professor uh, in the art department at our university uh, worked hand in glove with the a scientist from Kodak to produce that uh, uh, visualization. She is in fact, I will be meeting her in Chicago later today at the opening of a major exhibit at the Museum of Science and Industry called the Interactive Image uh, put together by Tom DeFonte there, another uh, great pioneer in computer art. Uh, so we see uh, these people working together very well uh, because computer art is done from the same machine as uh, computer science. Uh, in the, I'd like to show you a piece here, and I want to talk about it before I roll it, uh, that is, is very nice, I think. What, what this is is a, a work by Brian Evans, who is getting his Ph.D. in, in music at our university. And it's, it's very interesting. It, it takes a pure mathematical uh, form called fractals. Uh, 
a, a, a kind of mathematics that you may have seen recently with that has like snowflakes, uh, very, very intricate structures in them. But this is a pure mathematics. He then takes that mathematics and using the computer transforms it into a visual representation of that mathematics and at the same time a sonic, a sound representation. And as a composer, he is using the computer to intermediate between the abstraction of mathematics on the one hand and the abstractions of pure composition in art and sound on the other hand. And this composition was recently shown at an international uh, conference on computer music held at the University of Illinois this summer. And I think uh, we should just sit back and enjoy it. it um, pure aesthetics from, from supercomputers. Absolutely wonderful. In the time remaining, let's return to Geneva for another question. Go ahead, please, Geneva. Pascal Littel again from uh, the World Health Organization. Let me first say that I found uh, the fractals extremely impressive and beautiful. Thank you. Uh, my question is the following. Although computer technology is evolving very fast, most applications today are still programmed in COBOL for commercial applications or Fortran for a scientific application. I don't know the exact figure, but I would not be surprised that it's 80% or something, or even more. These two programming languages were developed in the late 50s, early 60s, and essentially based on the uh, von Neumann computer model, you know, is there a software revolution yet to come in order to take full advantage of the computing power that is available in supercomputers? Thank you. I surely hope so. Uh, as a scientist, I have, of course, always used Fortran in uh, writing my programs. Um, it, you know, it, it's certainly much better than using assembly language, which is the way it started out um, uh, back in the, in the 50s. Uh, we have seen a move from uh, machine language to assembly language to higher level languages like Fortran. Uh, we need to get to a point where the scientist or the engineer can program the computer at the level he's used to doing in his terms of science, the mathematical formulas of science, uh, of engineering, and that the artificial intelligence, if you like, or the new programming languages interpret that into the actual code that goes into the computer in a way that is most efficient for that particular architecture. We are nowhere near that point yet, but I think to get to the level of human productivity uh, that we must have, where the scientist can spend his time doing science, the, the engineer in the industry can spend his time 
creating that better product at a cheaper price at a faster uh, rate to market, we've got to get to that point. And so I think that uh, the air, one of the areas that just simply requires a great more, a deal more research is this area of computer science and the programming languages. The inertia that is represented, as you say, by the so much of our programs being written in standard uh, Fortran or COBOL, uh, of course, is a, is a major barrier to that happening. Uh, and this is not something that's going to happen overnight. It's going to take decades to, to really make that transition. Stuttgart, we have time for one more quick question and a quick answer. Let's have it from you, Stuttgart. Okay, this is Hart Blair again from IBM Böblingen. My question is with respect to fidelity of the results and accuracy. The supercomputer, as you lined out, does millions of thousands of millions of, of, of operations per second. It also can subtly introduce mistakes in the calculations. Now, there are two ways to cope with that. One is to have a very accurate architecture. The other is to, compl to complement the computation with physical experiments. Could you outline a little bit on that? Yes, I think it's absolutely uh, essential to make your computing program a instrument of scientific precision. That requires, as you say, testing it constantly against any known analytic or, or mathematical solution and whenever possible, testing it against laboratory experiment. That's an ongoing process, just as we have learned over the centuries to do in experimental work or theoretical work. And that part must be there if computational science is to join experimental and theoretical science as a third force in science, which we believe will happen in the coming decades. As we conclude, as we conclude today's program, I'd like to thank Dr. Smarr and Mr. Stevenson for joining us. Credit for this program should be given to WorldNet, the television and film service of the United States Information Agency. In Washington, I'm Jack Reynolds for WorldNet's Dialogue.